Thanks for joining us as we continue our study through the book of Psalms. It's our prayer that you are encouraged and that you grow as you open up your Bible and pray that God would speak to your hearts. It's our hope that you're hungrier to walk with Him closely, intimately, and that He impacts your life for His glory and for your good. Okay, Psalm 8. To the chief musician set to the lilies. And mostly we're going to read this. I'll, I'll point out a few highlights. In the book of Psalms, uh, there's just each psalm is so unique, but we have a few highlights on this, this actual passage. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Stir up your strength and come and save us. Restore us, O God, cause your face to shine, and we will be saved. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry against the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in great measure, and you've made us a strife to our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts, cause your face to shine, and we will be saved. We shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You have prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root. And it filled the land and hills were covered with its shadow and the mighty cedars with its bows or boughs. She sent out her boughs to the sea and her branches to the river. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by her way pluck her fruit? Or by the way, pluck her fruit. The boar out of the woods uproots it, and the wild beast of the field devours it. Return, we beseech you, or we beg you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see, and visit this vine and this vineyard which your hand has planted, the branch which you have made, strong for yourself. It is burned with fire, it is cut down, they perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, and upon the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we will not turn back from you. Revive us and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. Amen. So uh, a couple things that stood out to me. Uh, the latter part of the psalm, they're likening themselves. The, the nation of Israel is saying we're a vine and uh, the vineyard which you have planted. And I think if you just meditate on you know, what is what has Christ done in your life um, for us? And for me, there's been seasons in my life where the gratitude is more full than others, where I realize everything that's good in my life is definitely from the Lord. And there's some things that I would say are the most valuable part of my life. Um, my relationships, the joy of our salvation we've talked about in here, the satisfaction, the peace that we can have through Christ. There's those aspects of life that I did nothing to earn, did nothing to deserve, and pretty much everything in my life I've done nothing to deserve, but uh, you know, looking at this is God's hand. But yet there are times and seasons like verse 7 where we have to ask or we, we, on our hearts, it's our desire to say, Lord, we need you to restore us. In the context of this psalm, um, you're seeing him kind of the psalmist pleading uh, Asaph, he's pleading, saying, Lord, you've, you've allowed us to be trodden under the feet of other people. You've allowed us to be abused. You've allowed other people to basically come in and make a mockery of us and pick of our fruit. So take things from us. You've allowed that to happen. And at the end, um, there's some references, what it appears to be to the Messiah in verse 17. Let your, be, your hand be upon the man of your right hand. And the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. There's indications there that uh, the Lord's hand on the son of man, which was fulfilled by Jesus. And that through him, we won't turn back from God the father and he will revive us when we call upon his name. You look at Jesus, he said, uh, whoever believes in me will not perish, but he's already passed from death to life. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says... Uh, if you believe with your mouth or if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved for whoever confesses with their mouth and believes in their heart shall be saved. The Lord's desire is that all should be saved. 
but it comes to that point of they ha you have to come to a point where you realize you need the Lord. You need his hand. And the psalmist here indicates, look at all these terrible things that have happened, and yet we need you to restore us. We need your help. We need your hand. And verse 19 kind of concludes there, uh, we shall be saved. There's no doubt that we'll be saved if we believe in the Lord and we put our trust in Jesus Christ. But I think a lot of times we just get to where our eyes are not on how powerful he is. But he will save us. He's mighty to save. Psalm 81. Uh, the chief musician. To the chief, chief museum, musician on the instrument of Gath, a psalm of Asaph. So once again, a psalm of Asaph. We don't know if that was a person or if it was just a title. Um, but this is more of a, has some musical theme at the beginning. Sing aloud to God our strength. Make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a song and strike the timbrel or the tambourine. The pleasant harp with the lute. Um, which I think is like a flute. Blow the trumpet at the time of new moon and the full moon on our solemn feast day. For this is a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob that he established in Joseph as a testimony. When he went throughout the land of Egypt where I heard a language I did not understand. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were freed from the baskets. You called in trouble and I delivered you. I answered you in secret place, the secret place of thunder. I tested you in the waters of Meribah. Think about that, Selah, strife and contention. I know, and we've read it last week, but that God wants to over and over and over review his history with the people of Israel. And why do you think it is? Do you think it's because he just wants to hear himself talk? Or do you think it is because we do the same things that the children of Israel did? Here he talks about how he made a statute, a promise and a covenant with Jacob and Joseph. And they were in a land where they didn't even know the language really in Egypt. And he says here, I removed his shoulder from the burden, verse 6, because they called and I delivered. If you remember, Moses was called to be the deliverer to go to Pharaoh and tell them, let my people go. Because God said, I've heard their plea. I've heard the prayers of my people. So, my friends, if we just, if we look at the, the truth of the fact that it was God who is compassionate in the Old Testament. He's compassionate in the New. He was gracious and merciful then. He hasn't changed. He's no different. Um, and I like verse 7 where it talks about, I answered you in the secret place. You know, when Jesus talks in the Sermon on the Mount about prayer, it's about going into your quiet closet, not caring about necessarily doing things to be seen, but getting in that quiet place with him. And I'm glad that we have an intimate God. He's not far away. Hear, O my people, verse 8, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you listen to me, there shall be no foreign God among you. We still need that reminder. In our culture, there are a lot of foreign gods. There should be none numbered among us. We should not be worshiping anything but Christ. Nor shall you worship any foreign god. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. If you're hungry, just ask. Ask and you'll receive. But my people would not heed my voice. This is tragic. And Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their stubborn heart. Isn't that sad? Yep. It's sad that he would have to turn them over to their stubborn heart. But if you've been a parent or a grandparent, aunt, uncle, or whatever the authority you've had, maybe a, a boss and you have coworkers, they just won't take your advice. It's like, okay, have it your way, I guess. So he gave them over to their stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me. In the book of Revelation or the, the letter that John wrote to the churches, that Jesus wrote to the churches and John wrote it down. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, Jesus says all these, all these churches, there's uh, Thyatira, Smyrna, Pergamum. Uh, Ephesus is the first church, they lost their first love. Then you got Laodicea, Philadelphia. All these churches, Jesus at the end of his letter to each of the churches says, he who has ears, let him hear. So the constant reminder with Christ is you need to not just listen, but hear and understand and put it into practice. And that's what he's saying here in verse 13. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Jesus's desire in the book of Revelation is that we would walk in the ways of the Lord. 
And his constant reminder, he says it in all seven letters. So it's pretty important if he has, has to say it to every single church. But the, the goal of us listening to the Word of God and what we're doing this morning, you're here on a Sunday morning, you're here early, the desire is that we would walk with, with the Lord and in His ways, just like God desired Israel to. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to Him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I would have satisfied you. We miss out on the blessings when we don't see the blessings we already have and how good our Lord is. So what he's saying is, I could have blessed you more, Israel. If you would have been quicker to listen and less stubborn, I could have blessed you more. And as a parent, I can definitely relate to that. But you have a child and you give and you give and you give and you love and you give them the thing that they want. And one day later, they want more of it or they forget, well, you just got them yesterday. And that's exactly the way we are. And that's why he calls them the children of Israel. Uh, we are, we're children um, and we're Gentiles brought into the family of God. We're God's children. The thing that is key is we don't want to be childish. We want to be childlike. We want to be that child that says, daddy, I need you. And listens the first time and says, I know that, you know, why don't you tell me what you want to give me instead of me demanding from you as my father what I want because your hands are bigger and your generosity is better than what I could probably even hope for. Psalm 82, Psalm of Asaph. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Think about that. There are some corrupt court systems. Would you agree? Right now. Okay. And even if the person was the most godly Christian judge, um, which I think John Jay was the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. And he said, unless you're a Christian, you should not be on the Supreme Court. Because he just realized how awesome of a privilege it was. But the point is, even if you're a very strong Christian, we in our unglorified state are going to make corrupt decisions or not perfect decisions. Whereas God, his counsel is forever and perfect. So defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and the needy, deliver the poor and the needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness and the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods and all of you are the children of the most high. But you shall die like men and fall like the ones of or one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. OK, um, I don't know if you guys rem remember, but during Jesus's ministry, everybody got hung up in the Gospel of John. Everybody was hung up with Jesus because he claimed to be God, the son of God. And he said, why are you troubled with this? Because in your have you not read in your own scriptures, it says uh, right here, verse six, I have said, you are gods. John 10, 34 is when he's having this discussion, but I have said, you are gods and of all of you are children of the most high, but you shall die like men. The word gods there in Hebrew means judges, but it's like Elohim uh, gods It's a plural form um, in Genesis where it talks about the plural, but yet singular unit unit. Uh, unified form of God. It says Elohim. So it means gods. So some people try to twist that. Well, here he says in your own scriptures, it says that you are gods, you leaders and rulers of the people, meaning you, you are judges. The word means judges. Um, yet if it was just a matter of syntax or if it was just a matter of, if it was just a matter of, of them interpreting the word, he was saying, let's, let's apples and apples, oranges and oranges. Okay, let's compare things. He took them to their own scriptures and said, if you're going to hate me because I, I say I'm the son of God, you need to read your own scriptures because they say we all can be children of God. So that's basically what Jesus was saying. Well, verse 8 of Psalm 82, it says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. If you remember in Psalm 2, Psalm 1 was about the man who walks in the law of the Lord meditates on him. Psalm, Psalm 2, uh, Psalm 1 is about the person who meditates on the word of God. Psalm 2 is about the last days and how all the nations of the earth come against God. 
and they take counsel together, but the Lord holds them in derision. He scoffs at them and he, he thinks uh, about how ridiculous what they're doing is. And it says that uh, the son, he says, ask and I will give the nations to you as an inheritance. So when Christ comes back, he will rule and reign on earth. And when he creates the new heavens and the new earth, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But here it, it points that there's so many places in the Psalms, but this is Asaph talking, saying, God, the time is coming. And Revelation talks about it. Isaiah talks about it, where God is going to judge the earth and the, all the nations. Every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. So as corrupt as this world will get, every nation will eventually have to bow to Christ or suffer the consequences. So. Psalm 83. Okay, this is where I was thinking we were going to start today. But Psalm 83, if you are um, aware, does anybody study last day prophecies, a little bit of like end times um, eschatology or study of prophecies, end times events? Have you ever studied that? What I'd like you guys to write down on your notes or in your Bible is Ezekiel chapter 36 through 39. Right there beside Psalm 83, check out Ezekiel. Thank you. Ezekiel chapter 36 through 39. Chapter 36 is the regathering of the nation of Israel, which has happened since 1948, right before our very eyes. Immediately following the regathering and the blessing of all the fruit in, in chapter 37 through 39, you have an invasion of the land of Israel. And the nations that invade Israel are Iran, which is called Persia, Rosh, or uh, Gog of the land of Magog, which could be the Tsar of the land of Russia or somewhere from the north. There's some of the Balkan nations that are listed, and Togarma, Turkey, um, and a lot of the modern day co countries right now, uh, including Libya that are against Israel are named by name, by their ancient name. And it says that they come down to take plunder or to take booty from Israel. And it says the only thing where America might be mentioned in that entire prophecy, it says the young lions of Tarshish, which Tarshish was Spain, Portugal, or England, most likely England. It says the young lions of Tarshish say to these armies that are coming down in the last days that what have you come down to do? Have you come to take spoil? And that's all they do. They don't stop it. They just ask a question. And then it says that these armies invade and, and fire and brimstone rains down on them. They turn their swords on each other and an earthquake occurs and every wall falls. So there's been some earthquakes in that region right now too. So we may be on the verge of seeing Ezekiel 37 through 39 prior to the rapture simultaneous to the rapture, after the rapture, I don't know. But there's nothing really prohibiting that from happening. And all this military buildup around Syria and Israel has been pretty interesting. I've been watching it since 2010. And, and I was very skeptical at first, but the more you look at that passage, the more it seems like we're in that day. But Psalm 83 is interesting because it names by name all of these nations that are immediately bordering Israel and almost identical, but uh, it seems to be in a smaller skirmish. These nations come against Israel and they're put, put down by the Lord. The Lord uh, does, does with them. The prayer is that God would uh, make them like he did Sisera with Gideon. and uh, Or no, Sisera was with Deborah. Or like the Midianites with Gideon. So we're going to hit on that. But if you look at Psalm 83, it's also prophetic. And there's been some modern people that have looked at it. People have looked at it uh, in the past. That I can't really find... <clears throat> not to say I've spent... An incredible amount of time on it, but there are not a great deal of indications that Psalm 83 has already occurred. It could be a yet future thing. So whether it's happened in the in the past and it's going to happen again, uh, we definitely see there's an uh, animosity toward the nation of Israel, and this kind of hits on that. And there is a in the Psalms it says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we as Christians would not have the Bible if it weren't for the Jews. So by all means, we need to pray for the protection of them till they come to know the Lord. And there are Messianic Jews or Christians that live in Israel. So there are friends. They're the only friends we really have in the Middle East. 
Uh, I don't understand why our current administration has been so provocational toward them. Uh, but it does say in Genesis that I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you to the descendants of Abraham. So although I don't uh, necessarily send monies to the nation of Israel as a blanket thing, I do pray and I am interested in what's going on there. And I think in the book of Revelation it does say that at a certain point, uh, a large proportion, I think it's two thirds of all the people in Jerusalem are killed. I mean, there is a point where there is a lot of tribulation that comes upon the nation of Israel that we've still yet to see. Uh, but Romans 11, when Paul's talking about how he would wish himself to be cut off for the sake of his brethren, in Romans 11, he talks about how God is going to deal with the nation of Israel. Jesus says that the Jerusalem will be trodden down to the times of the Gentiles has come. So we are seeing the time of the Gentiles maybe come to an end, maybe a push for a one world order, which Revelation talks about. There's a tribulation, uh, a beast that then uh, at the end of the seven years is cast um, cast into the lake of fire um, and then Satan at the end of the thousand years is cast into the lake of fire. So we have all these different end times in events. I would say Psalm 83 and Psalm 36 through 39. 36 we've already seen happen. 37 through 39 and Psalm 83 may be imminent or we could be raptured or we may see this in our lifetime. I don't know. <clears throat> but interesting nonetheless. Some of that's conjecture but you know it's, it's biblical. Uh, people were probably wondering when Jesus came the first time about the prophecy in Micah where it says, Oh, you of Bethlehem are not uh, weak among the tribes, uh, but out of you will come one who will shepherd my people Israel. That was a prophecy in Micah. And when the wise men came all the way from Babylon, from Iraq, or from where Daniel was exiled in Babylon, they had studied the scripture, they had studied the stars, they came, and they came to King Herod, and Herod said, to the priests, knowing that there was a prophecy, he said, where is the king to be born? They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written. So there are things written that happened in, the, in that fulfillment in that time, but there's no more written about period of time than the last days, the tribulation, what's called Jacob's trouble. Um, we may not understand all the nuances. There are things we will not know, but uh, we know the times and the seasons, and we are to look up, for Jesus said, your redemption draws near. So my friends... As we read this, I just encourage you, live your life like Christ could call you home today, but also don't be afraid to live for however long he wants you to be here. And don't be afraid to go through the trial, but um, we're in it together. So let's read this. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult. It's kind of, kind of like a storm. And those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sh sheltered ones. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. That is exactly what the Ayatollah Khomeini in, in Iran has been saying. Death to America, death to Israel. And we want to nuke Israel and make them fall into the Mediterranean Sea. We want Israel to be a nation no more. It's happened before, it's still happening, that they, they're threatening this. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom, and I encourage you, if you want to study these, I, uh, these are all the surrounding regions immediately surrounding Israel. The tents of Edom, which was Esau's descendants, and the Ishmaelites, which they intermarried. Ishmael married uh, some Egyptians and Canaanites. He, mission, or he married several women. Moab and the Hag Hagrites. Moab, uh, Moabites were descendants of, of Lot. The Hagrites, uh, Hagar, maybe, or maybe Egyptian there. Let's see. Gebal, Ammon. Ammon and Moab were the, the children of Lot. Amalek, Philistia. Philist Philistia is kind of modern day Gaza. Philistines, they were from the Gaza Strip area. And the inhibit, inhabitants of Tyre, Tyre and Sidon are on the very northern tip. That's where Jesus started his ministry in the Gospel of Matthew. Tyre and Sidon had the huge sycamore trees that they sent. They sent the sycamore trees, I'll get it for you. Or they sent these cedars, sorry, the cedars of Lebanon. Tyre and Sidon were very wealthy and they were the merchants, they were the Phoenician Navy, but they're up north. Um, 
modern day Tyre does not really exist. Uh, there are some locations of where it used to be. The city of Tyre was scraped into the sea, actually, because of their wickedness and their abominations. It was prophesied against, I believe, in Ezekiel and uh, I think Alexander the Great scraped their city into the sea. Um, anyway, uh, with that being said, but Tyre, modern day Tyre, it's, it's a little bit different, but it's up on the northern uh, Northern, it's north of, of Israel, north of Haifa, all that on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. So they were sea traders. It was almost like a, a harbor or a port a city, but they were very wealthy. And then it says Assyria, Assyria has also joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot deal with them as with Midian and with, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook of Kishon. Who perished at Endor, who became the refuse of the earth, make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb. Yes, all their princes are like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. If you remember in verse 9, it says, deal with them as with Midian. Gideon was one of the judges and the Midianites were harassing the people of Israel. And in the, the miraculous way... Uh, Gideon had had the fleece that was wet and the ground was dry and then the fleece was dry the ground was wet and then he went uh, had 10,000 people God whittled them down to 300 and he took the 300 people surrounded the Midianites they blew their trumpets they cracked their basins and then they had the torches everybody killed themselves and the Midianites ran for their lives and they destroyed all the Midianites so what this prayer of Asaph he's saying is all these nations who want Israel to just disintegrate and go away Make them like the Midianites. Make them turn against each other. Interesting. Make them run for their lives and be, be made to nothing. And give them terror. Okay? They're trying to terrorize the Israelites right now. Right? Modern day Israel is being faced with terror all the time, right? What if those tables got turned? And it says, with Sisera, as with Jabin, the brook of Kishon. Sisera um, had come against the Israelites when there was not really a judge uh, there was a man named Barak interesting right there was a man named Barak and he did nothing and he would not step up and he had no gusto so it had to be a woman named Deborah or Deborah who said um, hey don't you realize God's gonna give uh, this Sisera into your hands you need to stand up and be a man and if you won't, I will do it. But you, and he's like, I'll go if you go with me, basically. Like Barak is kind of doing that. Well, Barak goes with Deborah. Deborah and 10,000 other men with, with, uh, with Barak. I mean, Barak had 10,000 men at his disposal as an Israelite. And they're, they're facing this enemy. The 10,000 of them, they kill all of Sisera's men. But Sisera breaks free and he runs away. And as the story goes, he gets to this house and this woman named Jael or Jael, she says, why don't you rest here? You know, watch some Netflix, you know, here's a blanket, here's some yogurt. No, she sets him down and when he falls asleep, he's so, so tired from running for his life. My boys love this story. It's terrible, but she takes a tent peg and she sticks it through his head and, and hammers it through his temple. Anyways. So it said, Deborah said, you can't stand up, Barak, and do what God wants you to do. Well, you're going to win this battle, but it's going to be by the hand of a woman. And Jael, I mean, by Deborah's help, encouraging the men, the soldiers, and by Jael or Jael killing this man, it was the woman, the women who stepped up. So go women, right? <laughs> women of God. You, you ladies are, are just as strong. Um, and, and really, it doesn't matter. Are you a man or a woman? No. Do you love the Lord? Do you trust in Jesus? Do you have him in your life? Are you walking with him? Are you talking with him? Are you filled with the spirit? That's all that matters. So, but the point is, do you want to be on the side of the UN or on the side of Iran or on the side of these nations um, who are desiring to destroy Israel if their end is going to be like the Midianites or like Sisera? I don't think so. So... At that point, uh, you look at this, this and what's coming for those nations. They've got what's coming to them. 
Okay, oh my God, verse 13, uh, Psalm 83. Make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind, as a fire burns the woods and the flame sets the mountains on fire. Kind of like a Exodus when Moses received the law. So pursue them with your tempest or your storm and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. In Ezekiel 37 and 38 and 39. It says that there's a great earthquake, fire called, comes down from heaven, they turn their swords against each other. But then it says that five, six, five out of every six soldiers in those nations' armies that come against Israel are killed. It says that they're burying bodies for seven years, and they're, or for seven months. And when people find a body, they put a standard by it, and designated body barriers come and bury that body. And then it says that they burn their weapons for fuel for seven years, which indicates it might be before the, the beginning of the tribulation. But the point is, um, he surrounds them with a storm. Well, fire and brimstone and an earthquake and Ezekiel sound like a storm to me. So maybe these are in rapid succession right after each other. Frighten them. Okay, they're going to be scared. But the point is, God wants his enemies to come to repentance and believe in him. And there will be a revival. I mean, you, you come against the Lord or, you, you know, children that grow up in a nation that came against the Israel, Israel will know of their history that they tried to resist Israel and look what happened and they may trust in the Lord. But that is the point in Ezekiel. I think it's over 60 times it says that they may know that I am the Lord because of all these things that happen. God wants his name to be lifted up. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yet let, yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are most high over all the earth. He is above everything. Um, have a note here. You know, it's God's grace that He wants people to come to. But if you're going to oppose the God who's gracious and kind, His goal is for you to receive His grace. But he is just as well, and he has to punish evil. And that's the thing I think uh, people don't understand, but if we don't have a just and a gracious God, it doesn't make sense. It's not balanced, but we have to see both sides. Um, there's much more, there's many more facets we could discuss about the nature of God, but those, those two are very key. They have to go together. Psalm 84, a wonderful psalm. We'll probably end with this today, pick up where we left off. Psalm 84, to the chief musician on the instrument of Gath, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Remember, Korah's rebellion. Korah, and his, in the time of the wilderness, he said, what makes you so special, Moses? Can't God speak to all of us? And Moses and Aaron, what's so special about you? Moses said, all right, we don't, we're not trying to make ourselves anything special. Let's put our staffs out. And whoever's staff buds then we know that God's with them. Aaron puts a staff out there and it's like the next morning and there's almond blossoms and almonds on the almond tree branch that he has for a staff. It's like, yeah, you probably shouldn't mess with God's anointed. And, and basically this, the rebellious heart of the people, um, Korah and his family died. So Korah's descendants, they, they had tasted some bitterness of the punishment of God, yet uh, they were Levites, but they, they trusted in the Lord and this, these are obviously his descendants. So you'd be a grandchild of someone who ended in that type of, of fate. You'd probably be pretty humbled. How lovely is your tabernacle or your tent, O Lord of hosts, your dwelling place. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. It's an awesome thing when you're hungry for the Lord because you never need anyone to pressure you. And you realize you really can't do anything apart from him. Like he says in, in John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. When you're hungry and thirsty, also, I think it's Isaiah 55. It says, uh, come to me, all who thirst, all who are hungry and eat of the food that has no cost and drink. And Jesus says, anyone who drinks in John chapter four, the woman at the well, anyone who drinks of the water that I give will never thirst again. Psalm uh, 84, we'll look at verse 3. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Jesus said, 
Not one sparrow falls to the ground without me knowing it. If he cares enough about the birds, I put something on my Facebook about the insect world. You guys can check it out. There are thousands of pictures of these insects that are so incredible. If he cares so much about a little bug, an aphid or a little uh, worm or a butterfly or a moth, it makes them so intricate. How much more does he care about us? And that's what it's saying here. You even give the swallow or the sparrow a place to rest. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Okay, We'll never run out of desire to praise him as we continue to grow in the Lord. And we will never run out of things to praise him for as we discover more of his glory in heaven. That's going to be exciting. I don't know if there will be golf there or if there will be, you know, certain sports, but if you play golf or other sports, you'll be better at it. So you won't be as upset if you don't do well. Okay. Verse five, blessed is a man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Yes. Our, and that's, I just, I am so blessed when I realize this is not my home. Been through some stuff in the last week or two where we had to make some tough decisions and corporate greed just drives me crazy. And so I'm just like, you know, Lord, it's yours. Just commit it to you. And I know this is not my home. We're just pilgrims. So for me, if my heart is set on a pilgrimage, like I'm ready to leave this place, be with my heavenly father, it puts me in a better place with my attitude and my, my spirit. <clears throat> Verse six, as they pass through the valley of ba uh, Baca, or Baca, sorry, weeping, the valley of weeping, they make it a spring. The rains also covers it. The rain also covers it with pools. You know, there are valleys that we experience in life that are suffering and painful. But God can make those valleys into reservoirs of his living water and healing. And you can use your suffering to pour out into others. You can use your pain to help others. And I think that Rachel Clement is a very good example of this. Just with one of our close friends, what she's gone through. But I think we all have that. And it doesn't, you don't need to diminish the small trials that you've been through. But whatever it is. It's healing to let God fill that valley of your life with his water. And then it's also healing to refresh others. It says in the Proverbs that he who refreshes others is refreshed himself. So uh, it's good to know that we have a God who can make our, our valleys into places of refreshing. They go from strength to strength. New Testament says from grace to grace or glory to glory. Each one appears before God in Zion or heaven or Jerusalem. O oh Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Think about that. He's listening to us. O oh God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed, the Messiah. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield and the Lord will give grace and glory. And no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. The Lord God of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. We have a God who gives us everything we need if we just want to walk with him. And we have a God who gives us a place to reside forever, an eternal abode, a house that will never need maintenance on our part. You know, he's got it. He's got it all taken care of. But one day, better is one day in his palace, his place, his, this abiding place he has for us than a thousand elsewhere. So... May we meditate on that truth. May we look up for our redemption draws near. May we look at Psalm 83 and maybe check the headlines. Look at Ezekiel 36 through 39 and look at what God's doing before our very eyes. And in the meantime, may we reach out and invite other people to come into the kingdom. And I pray that you are getting those opportunities in your neighborhood, at your workplace. I'm talking with the, the band and our small group. We've had opportunities in our neighborhood. I think we just need to be praying that there will be people that would respond while the harvest is still ripe and while we have the chance. So make the most of your days. Father, we thank you that you have uh, given us responsibility. You've given us a hope. You've given us a place in your house. Uh, Lord, that you are great in all the earth and you will uh, be just and fair. But you also want all to come to repentance and to come to a place where they trust in you. Use our lives. Fill us with your spirit. Guide us today. Um, I pray that you would give us enthusiasm as we, to be filled with you, Lord, um, as we desire to walk with you. 
And we know that no good thing will you withhold from those who want to walk uprightly. Lord, make that the desire of our heart to walk uprightly with you, keep on keeping our eyes and our focus on you and knowing that uh, you can sustain us and you will lead us. Uh, keep our eyes on you, Lord, we pray. Uh, bless this morning. Bless the pastor who's preaching, the teaching, and uh, our relationships in this place and our witness and our testimony. May you continue to equip us. And uh, Lord, our souls long for you. We're thirsty and hungry for you. We know that you've satisfied us and you will continue to. We thank you for that. We glorify you and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us again as we continue our study through the book of Psalms. Tune in to our YouTube channel as you can find a variety of studies as they come. We will be posting them. So appreciate it if you would subscribe and share them with your friends. And feel free to join us at Glenville Church, 4604 South Seneca, Wichita, Kansas. You can reach us at 524-6801. We have Sunday morning services at 1030 a.m. with Sunday school starting at 930 a.m. And on Wednesday evenings, we have things for all ages, including Awana, youth, and a variety of Bible studies. It's our prayer that you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen.